All right, I've got no students, which is a first, I think, but uh, they've been showing up for my other classes, so I think I will create the video, assuming people are gonna look at the video later. So we're here to talk about 64-bit assembly, and uh, I've adjusted the time for this exploit development class here, and be aware that there are some online events coming in a couple of weeks that are worth going to, and I've delayed the April 25th class, rather made it meet earlier at noon, so we can go to this thing. I highly recommend going to these Pacific Hackers online events. I'll be there. Anyway, uh, let's talk about 64-bit assembler. And so in, you're used to the 32-bit slides that you've been, uh, the 32-bit registers that we've been using before, but in 64 bits, you have R, R-A-X, R-B-X, R-S-P, and so on, uh, instead of E-A-X and E-B-X. And so R-I-P is the instruction pointer, and R-S-P is the top of the stack. And they're 64 bits wide, although you can refer to portions of them. You can refer to the lower 32 bits the same way you would in a 32-bit processor like E-A-X, and uh, ESP, or the 16 bits, or even the 8 bits, for compatibility with older uh, commands, and for special cases. Windows doesn't actually implement all 64 bits. Uh, it is used to move in data in instructions and do things like addition and move operations, but it is not used for addressing. In fact, it only uses 48 bits. So that means it has a strange result. Um, there are some other versions of Windows that have different limitations. But the, what happens is it means the legal address spaces are split. There's a high portion and a low portion. So all the addresses have to either start with a lot of Fs or a lot of zeros. And any addresses that start with anything else are uh, unused. So Actually, it always at least two zero or 56 bit and 48 bit always at least four zeros or four Fs. And that's what modern versions of Windows use. Although I'm not sure about server 2019, I haven't checked it yet. We don't use int 80 anymore. We use syscall. Syscall is the kernel call. And as most 64 bit instructions, you pass um, parameters in in the registers. This is much more common than passing arguments on the stack. Because in 64-bit processor, you have plenty of uh, registers available. So there's an online syscall table. You can go to look at them all. And so syscall 0 will read and syscall 1 will write. So you can look them up online and get a lot more information about the registers. There are more registers than what I've shown you before. There are 128-bit registers called XMM and there are floating point registers. There's quite a few other types out there, but most of the simple instructions just use the general purpose registers, and that's all we're going to use. You do see on this one on the top right, the RIP, the instruction pointer, which was sort of conspicuously absent in the list on the top left. You do have an instruction pointer and it's 64 bits. So you have the same kind of opcodes that you've seen in 32-bit processors, you have move, add, multiply, divide, compare, and so on. And so syscall1 write works like this. You execute a syscall and you put rax equal to 1. That makes it a write operation. And now you can, rdi has the file descriptor. So it would be 1 if you want to print to the console. And then you put the string on the stack and set rsi to rsp. So RSI contains a pointer to the string you want to print, and RDX has the length of the string. So you do use the stack, but you don't have to use the stack the way you do in 32-bit calls. You could have put that data anywhere as long as you provided a pointer to it. So let's look at some simple programs, and I'm going to shrink this down and look at them live over here. So let's get it here. I've got them all running in my Google Cloud machine, and I think I'll make the font bigger in case this video is blurry, which it tends to be. And shove this thing over to the side. All right. So the first one is ABC1. Oh, 
All right, so we only have one section, the text section that contains executable instructions, and we start at this start marker, and we have just a few instructions, and there are comments at the end here. So I'm gonna move RAX with this immediate value, which is a 64-bit value. And you should recognize by now this is A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H in ASCII, capital letters. So we put that in RAX, we push it onto the stack. Now we put the length of the string eight bytes in RDX and we put the stack pointer in RSI and zero one in RAX. And now we're ready to um, just put the standard out here and now we can execute a syscall. So this entire series of instructions prepares for one syscall. This prepares all the arguments, including the string, and now it's ready to print. So you can compile that with Yasm. You just have to install Yasm and compile that 64-bit code, and you end up with um, abc1.out. I think it's ut, let's see. Oh, that's why I spelled it wrong. ABC one dot out. There we are. And so when you run it, you get the letters backwards and then you get a seg fault. So there are a couple of interesting issues here. You might wonder why the letters are backwards. That should be no surprise. You've been through this a lot in the buffer workflow exploits. You have to put letters in backwards because of the little endian system used by Intel processors. So that we can fix. The seg fault is because, let me adjust my view here to uh, fit. All right. The seg fault happens because we didn't properly exit. So we're here. All right. So we need to also add a call to exit. And exit is just uh, syscall 60, which is 3C, and we don't need any parameters for that. So that one should be the next one, ABC2. All right, so we just do the same thing as before, and here is the exit. We just set 3C and then do a syscall. So if I run that one, I've already compiled it. ABC2, it prints the letters backwards and then doesn't give me a, a seg fault. So all I've done is correct the exit. So the last issue to fix about my program here is that the letters are backwards. So let's Take a look at that. In order to fix that, the simplest answer is just put them here, referring to them in reverse order. So now I put them in, I just changed this one command to load it differently. And now that one will print the letters in order and then exit. So that's the simplest uh, syscall situation. All right. Now you could put the data in a data section. So that would be hello.asm, which I think I have here. Uh, uh, hello, I got hello.out, hello.o. I'm strangely not seeing hello.asm. Um, there it is. I just, uh, oh, this thing is alphabetical in a strange way. Okay, so cat hello.asm. All right, so this one now has two sections, a data section and a text section. And up here in the data section, I create my string and now I can write it in correct order and as readable text. And then I put a comma 10, 10 is gonna be the line feed. So now I've got a length and a line feed. And now I just put in a pointer to that string. So I give it a name, string, and I refer to that string down here. So I put that in RSI. So now I've got a much more elegant program I don't have to turn things into ASCII manually, and I even get a character turn at the end and such. So now I have accomplished essentially the printf command in C. All right. We can take a look at it with obj dump, and you'll see the sections. If I do obj dump minus x on hello.out, it will show you the sections. Here's the symbol table. So I have a text section and a data section, an assembly section and so on. And here they are. Remember we talked about this in, we're looking at Windows code. Every program thinks it is living at 400,000. This is a virtual address. And it created the data section up here somewhere else. And it started up there. So that's the game here. All right. And up, 
earlier, it told me that it was ELF 64 and so on. So we can use GDB to examine it and you'll see the same thing that it loads. Let's do that so we can see the addressing. Uh, so GDB on hello.asa or dot out rather. All right. And I'll put a break at start and then run so it's loaded correctly. And now I can do info proc map. And I can see what actual addresses were used. And here you have the, um, the range at 40,000 and the range at 60,000. And you can see the addresses here. These are the addresses that start with a lot of zeros. And here are the addresses that start with a lot of Fs. And it skips something and only shows it starting a 7F here. Uh, I'm not quite sure why it shows it that way, but here's, oh, the, oh the, uh, excuse me, the 7F here is at the top of the low order addresses. And here's an address way up at the second high level range. So you've got two sections, both in the low part of memory, and here's one in the high part of memory. Anyway, that's the game there. You can see the, uh, the locations here. All right. And if we examine this, to look at the instructions, 0x, 4,000, B0. All right. Uh, you can see here, it, this is where it loads this data. So it puts a 0d, which is the length of the string, into RDX. It puts a pointer into RSI. Then it puts a 1 in and a 1 in. One of those is device number 1 to print to the console and the other is syscall number one to write, and then it calls syscall. Here it is putting the exit number in RAX and making the next syscall. So we might wonder what is at this address, 0x600d8, and we can examine it. If we do say 4x at that address, we'll see it in hex, and you can recognize if you're used to it that this is ASCII. You can also view it as characters. So I can put 20, C here, and then it will be a little more readable. It puts in the H E L L O space world and so on. So you can see what is done in GDB. And if you look at the registers, you'll see most of the registers have nothing. Here's the RSP pointing to that location on the stack. Here's the RIP pointing to that address near 400,000 where the instructions are. And uh, that's how it looks. Notice that the registers are not EIX and EBX, and it's not EIP, it's RIP. These are, in fact, 64-bit registers. It's not obvious that they're 64-bit, except for this one, which is certainly longer than a 32-bit instruction, or a 32-bit data value. All right, so read is very much the same. Let's look at read.asm. Um, All right, so again, I, now here I define a data section and I define a string that's 10 characters long, just so I have some place to store the data and I fill it with dummy data. That's just how I chose to reserve it. Then I have a text section and here I set the length of the string to 10 bytes, a pointer to the string, and now it's just called a zero is read and the device number is zero for standard in. So when you make the syscall here, it will read 10 characters or up to 10 characters from the um, standard input, which is the console. And then down here, it's gonna print them out. So I go back to 10, the same pointer. Uh, now device number one, which is printing to the console and um, syscall number one, which is writing. So I'm just going to echo back what I read in. And that will be interesting because it's not gonna do a very good job. All right. So if I run that and I say, hello, I get back hello, but then it puts a carriage return, which does I type the carriage return here, and it interpreted that as a character to read in. And then it has BBCC, because the leftover characters end up here. So it um, does have extra junk because of the way I reserved that memory. And I didn't put a null byte at the end. All right, so I get junk at the end. So we can now make a seizure site. So the first one here is, Caesar.asm. So I'm going to define a data section. I'm going to reserve space for eight characters, just putting in A's and B's. Now I'm going to use a read, syscall 
zero is read. That should say zero instead of one. Anyway, um, I'm going to read up to eight characters from the keyboard. Then I'm going to add one, 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 one to them. And then I'm going to print that out. So this will accomplish the seizure cipher. Now, this is a pretty sloppy seizure cipher. The original seizure cipher only worked for, say, capital letters or grab Z back around to A. And I'm not taking care of that. Also, if I were to put in the unprintable character FF, it would add one and roll it around to zero and affect the next letter. So there's various defects here. But for simple cases, this ought to work. So let's try running this one, which is Caesar one dot out. Uh, perhaps I just called it Caesar. Just called it Caesar. All right. All right. So if I give it A B C, it gives me back B C D, and then it has some extra junk at the end. So it looks pretty good. But if I give it A B C D E F G H. It takes A, B, C, D and turns it into B, C, D, E, but E, F, G, H is not changed. And that is very strange because here I tried to add eight bytes of one and it only changed four of them. So that is disturbing. We can find out why with obj dump. Obj dump minus D for Caesar dot out. Notice that although I entered a command with 64 bits of 0, 1, it actually did an add of only 32 bits of 0, 1. And you can see it right here. Here's the command, and here's the immediate 32-bit value. It's not an immediate 64-bit value, which is what I specified in my assembly code. Now, that is rude. It did not compile my assembly code into instructions that actually did what I told it to. It silently changed them into other instructions that are different. Very rude indeed. And the reason why it had to do that, now I don't know why it didn't tell me, but the reason it had to do that is because the instruction I asked for does not exist. If you look here, this is the uh, 64 and 32 bit software developers manual. And you see what commands exist here. And in order to do what we're doing here, let me make this big, but not quite as big so I can still point it around. Okay. These are the prototype instructions. I can add an immediate 8-bit value to a register, or 16, or 32, but I cannot add an immediate 64-bit value to the registers. Now, I don't know why, but the developers of the Intel instruction set did not include that instruction, so it cannot create that command. So, if I want to do it, you can add 64-bit um, values, but you can't do it in immediate registers. You have to you add, immediate, you add an immediate value right to and register like AX, you can add two registers together though, and that'll be a 64-bit operation. So to accomplish what I want to do here, I have to do it in two stages. I have to um, put that 64-bit value in a register and then add the registers together. So let's look at that one. That is gonna be, I think, seizure two. Yeah, seizure two, okay. All right. So now I have made two instructions where I used to have one. First, I put a 64-bit value at R8, and then I add R8 to RCX, which is what contains the string. So those two commands should have the desired result. And if I run that one, seizure two dot out, and now I give it A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, it adds one to all of them. H goes to I, G goes to H, and so on. So that's what you have to do. You have to use two instructions. So, um, there are some challenges for you to solve in this project. You have to write a hello from your name, a small modification. Then you have to make a seizure that goes back three steps instead of going forward one step. And figure out how to do XOR encryption in assembly language. Uh, those are some things to do. I've got some cahoots, but I'll have to wait until I have some live students to do those, obviously. So, the 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 stuff I've shown you is in this project. And if I go here and go to projects here, you will find it here, intro to 64-bit assembly. So these are the, this is where you get to practice doing these things, and I highly recommend it. So you have a series of programs to make and a series of challenges and flags to find. So I hope you folks are doing well. I uh, 
I'm surprised that nobody showed up at all, but I am aware that everybody's life is greatly disrupted by the current emergency. And I will do this again next week. I'll put up this video and we are still grading homework and all that. The college is officially in session, although the buildings are not open. So I hope somebody shows up next time. And that's it for this time. Farewell.